when you play to your strengths, you experience joy, happiness, contentment, satisfaction, and even, I think, more resilience. Um, I think that there's a, a willingness to overcome more of the hard things when you play to your strengths. Hello and welcome. I'm Eric Corum and you're listening to the Blueprint Podcast, where we explore the journey of high performance by learning from the struggles and triumphs of some of the most interesting people in the world. Kelly Clendenning is a female empowerment and career coach that helps women leave unsustainable work environments and find jobs that they love. In this episode, Kelly details how she was able to step out of an unhealthy work environment and into her dream job, and how that led her down the path of helping other women find fulfillment in their careers. If you feel stuck right now in your current job, this podcast is for you. If you find today's podcast to be valuable, go to www. Dot ericquorum.com and sign up for my high performance newsletter. In this newsletter, I'll provide you with valuable resources and information to help you pursue audacious goals, thrive in uncertainty, and live a healthy and fulfilled life. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Kelly, it's great to have you on with us today. Eric, thanks so much for having me. This is so fun. I'm excited. So I want to start with just asking you, like, what does it mean to be a female empowerment coach and career coach? Yeah. So I help women leave unsustainable work environments and find jobs they love. So an unsustainable work environment is unfulfilling work, toxic workplace culture, sexual harassment, or even burnout. Mm -hmm. And when we're experiencing any one of these things, it typically leads to some sort of unhappiness or discontent. Mm. And, you know, when we're really unhappy at work, it affects not just our day to day, but it affects everything else in our lives. Um, It can affect our health, our well-being, and then also how we show up for the people that we love. And so, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And so when, my clients come to me, they know that they want to leave their jobs or maybe they already have, and they know they want to do something different, but they have no clue about what, what's next, what that thing is. So wow. That's a pretty them, powerful position for you to be in, in regards to kind of steering the future for them. Yeah, it is. And it's, that's actually my favorite place to jump in and work with clients One of the things that I help people with is understanding their strengths. And one of my strengths is future planning. And so I love when it's basically a blank slate for someone, like anything's possible. And that's when I love to jump in and help them figure it out. So how did you end up in this this role of being able to help create a future for somebody? Yeah. So right out of college, I started a career in the wine industry. I was a Latin American studies major, and I learned that you could work harvest in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, um, and I really wanted to find a way to be able to work in Latin America. So I jumped into the wine industry, and that's what I did. I learned about making wine. I learned about selling wine. And by my mid twenties, I was a certified sommelier. Have you, Eric? Have you ever seen the movie or the documentary Psalm? I have not. Okay. Well, essentially, it's the the path to becoming a sommelier, and I didn't go to that particular level, the master Psalm. That's only a handful of people, but I did start that path. You're gonna have to excuse my ignorance. What is a sommelier? Oh, no problem. Um, A sommelier is basically a wine expert. Okay. It's one of those people, probably not anymore at restaurants or in COVID, but it's that person. Yeah. Yeah. At a restaurant. So they create the wine list. They essentially are an expert in smelling and tasting and pairing food and wine together. Okay. So is Gary Vee a sommelier? I don't know. 
Because you know he had that whole, like, wine, Gary Vanderchuk, uh, VaynerMedia. Oh, right. You know, I don't, I don't know if his background is in that. Anyways, totally off topic. Sorry. No, it's okay. No. Um, yeah. So that's what, that's what a sommelier is. Somebody okay. who is a wine expert who pairs food and wine and knows about the various wines of the world. Essentially. Yeah. So you get to taste amazing food, drink amazing wine, and then tell people what works. Yes. That's awesome. You must have a yeah. great palate. You know, it's developed. That's something that's a skill that's developed. Anybody can develop that skill, I think. Mm. And so I became certified as a sommelier and I got, this was in my mid twenties and I got this great job in sales and marketing um, in the wine industry. So I was given a lot of responsibility. I had a lot of autonomy over my projects. I got to manage the accounts of important customers. I was basically paid to network and I love meeting people. So it was really fun. Nice. And it was a big growth opportunity. So this particular job had a lot of good things going, but I also found myself in a really uncomfortable situation, which was I was being sexually harassed by my boss. And what I found to be especially challenging about this situation is that I had no idea how to handle it. Mm. There was no manual on how to handle a situation like this. And I also didn't know who to turn to. This was before the Me Too movement. Right. So it actually felt very lonely because I didn't know anyone that had had a similar experience. Mm. So my first strategy was to pretend like it wasn't happening and tried to ignore it. I would highly recommend not using that as a strategy because that did not make it go away. Mm. Was this impacting your personal life at this time? I mean, it was like affecting yeah, you. Big you know, time. Yeah. yeah. It, it was really stressful too. Yeah. Stressful to figure out how to manage it. And so I was bringing that stress home. So it definitely was impacting my, my personal life as well. And eventually there was a boiling over point where I knew I had to confront my boss and I did and I asked him to stop, but that actually didn't change anything. Really? So it was really at that moment where I figured out, okay, I need to leave. And it was that moment where I knew, okay, I want to move on, but I had no idea what was next. Mm -hmm. I wanted to step into something I was really excited about. I didn't want to just make a lateral move and do something similar to what I was doing. I wanted to grow and do something different. And the sales and marketing job had been great, but I still wanted to maybe have an opportunity to work abroad. Okay. And so that's when I hired a coach. Hmm. How did you find this coach? Yeah. I found her through a coaching network. Essentially, it's like a coach's database. And I reached out to a handful of coaches. She's the one that got back to me the quickest. And she did a discovery session with me. So I got, I had never worked with a coach. So I didn't know, you know, what to expect. Mm -hmm. And so I got to just get a feel for what it was like to be coached by her. And we had such a strong connection. And I felt like she really understood who I was and what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And she was also a traveler. She also enjoyed traveling. So I felt like I really had some, she would be a strong member on my team, right? The person in my corner. And so within a few months of working with her, I left my job. I traveled for six months through Latin America and I ended up stepping into a very fulfilling role as a trip leader for a luxury outdoor vacation company. That's pretty awesome. So when you made this leap, like what did your family think? Oh my gosh, that is such a great question. They were really excited for me. And luckily I come, my family is very supportive. They were really excited for me because they saw the stress that my previous job had and the toll really that it had taken on me. And so 
they would say to me, we just want you to be happy. Right. Mm -hmm. So I had their support the whole time to leave. But I think as I look back now, it was really that self permission. I needed to give myself the permission that it was okay to leave this job that had a lot of markers for success, quote unquote. And that, yeah, it was, it's really the self permission. So my family was very supportive. That's interesting that you had to give yourself permission. Is that something that your coach taught you? It's something that I discovered through the process Mm -hmm. that that was the thing that was mostly holding me back. Okay. So it was mostly I was holding myself back from saying it's okay to leave this job that, you know, again, it plays a lot of, a lot to the markers of success. It has a lot of markers for success, but it's okay to leave it, even though, you know, you're leaving some big things behind. Okay. That's mm-hmm. really interesting. So you, you, you're now working for this luxury travel agent, I mean, uh, trip company. What are you mm-hmm. doing? Like, like these luxury expeditions. I mean, I'm just imagining some stuff down in South America. I mean, what's happening here? Yeah. Yeah. So what I was was a trip leader. So okay. I was on the ground with a group of 20 people who had signed up for this trip. They didn't know each other. And I was leading them through, I specifically worked in Costa Rica. So I would take them on week long vacation trips where they would bike or hike from hotel to hotel. So the idea is that they get to see a place, not by bus. Mm. or really by car, but by actively traveling through a specific region. And so we'd stay at three or four different hotels throughout the trip. And so essentially, they just get to show up. We provide their bikes, we provide their schedule, and then we support them throughout the trip. And essentially, at the end of the trip, everybody's really close and has developed these really strong bonds. And so I would do that every week have a new group like that. What did you learn throughout that process about yourself and like, like this ability for people to create relationships pretty quickly? So what I learned, that's such a great question. What I learned is that relationship building is one of my strengths. Okay, It's my main strength actually. And so that's something that I teach my clients is that when you play to your strengths, you experience joy, happiness, contentment, satisfaction, and even, I think, more resilience. Hmm. Um, I think that there's a a willingness to overcome more of the hard things when you play to your strengths. And so what was so unique about this particular job is that it really played to my top strength, which was relationship building, thinking about the future, and then planning. Hmm. All of those really came into play when you're managing a a trip for 20 people. Nice. Now, what caused you to transition out of that? How long were you down in Costa Rica? So that particular, the Costa Rica trips didn't run year round. So I would go between working in wine country. So back up in Napa Valley. So getting to work in my backyard Hmm. um, as a trip leader. And then, and so that was during you know, one portion of the year. And then when trips were running in Costa Rica, I would then fly down there and work down there for a certain period of time. And how many years did you do this? So I worked for this company for three to four years and I still lead trips for them sometimes, which is really nice. Okay. That's pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. You You must have left a lasting impression. So what, what's the reason you decided to transition into being a coach yourself? Like what was the impetus for that change? So given my experience, this transition going from a unhealthy, unsustainable work environment Mm -hmm. that, you know, really severely impacted my life in a negative way. And then finding a job that I really loved. I just felt really called to help other women to help them make that transition as well. Mm. And so I decided as I was also being a trip leader to start taking courses to become certified as a professional coach. And so now I am a certified professional coach. Nice. 
So what's this process that you're teaching people to go through to kind of identify like what the future has for them, like when they want to transition? Yeah. So one of my clients recently told me that before we started working together, that she had gone to the top of the proverbial mountain to figure out what she wanted to do with her life. She was hoping to get that lightning bolt of inspiration. And mm-hmm. instead she heard cricket. <laughs> and I just love that um, because I think it's really true for, and really common for a lot of people. And so, you know, they, they finally get to a place where they're, or maybe they're forced, right? They maybe are laid off or in a really bad situation at work mm-hmm. where they're ready to make a change, but they have no idea what's next. And so, when the future feels like a blank slate, that can be definitely overwhelming and even paralyzing. Mm. So when someone comes to me, they usually say, I just want to be happy. And I completely get that because I've been there. And what I do is I like to guide our conversations, maybe away from the sense of happiness and more towards fulfillment. Mm. Because I think Happiness is a feeling, it can come and it can go, but fulfillment is more of a state of being. And in fulfillment, we can feel happy, but we can also feel joy and contentment and peace. And again, that resilience. So that's where I start with our conversations. And I've found that through um, my own experience of that of my clients, there's four components to career fulfillment. Okay. So the first is playing to your natural strengths. So we've already touched on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. Gallup, the creator of Clifton Strengths, which is a strengths finder, reports that people who use their strengths every day are three times more likely to report having an excellent quality of life six times more likely to be engaged at work, 8% more productive, and 15% less likely to quit their jobs. Wow, that's totally Which true. Which I think is really impressive. Like, I think that data is really impressive. Yeah, I just can think back to times that I didn't feel like my strengths were being used. There's nothing worse than having a boss that doesn't like look for what you do well and let you express that. And... Uh, as I've advanced in my career, when I've worked or built teams, I'm always trying to find somebody that has a natural talent or ability and just let them go do what they do. Because there's, even if you don't get paid as much or it's just so much fulfillment, right? I, I'm saying it right now, but it makes so much sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to describe it as it's the difference between jumping in a river and trying to swim upstream against the current versus jumping in the river and letting the current take you downstream. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, it's the difference between muscling through something Mm -hmm. versus doing something that really gets you into a state of flow, for example. So that's one of the first things that I like to focus on with clients is playing to their natural strengths. So identifying them and understanding ways that those strengths already show up in their current work situation. And then how can we bring more of those strengths to their next work situation? Gotcha. The second component is doing work that aligns with your why. So, And this is about being connected to something larger than yourself and doing something that feels meaningful. Mm. So I think what's really interesting that as humans, we've actually evolved to contribute and help others. So it's just part of who we are. So finding meaning and feeling as though our contribution matters is really part of being human. Mm. And so with some clients, it's really clear what their life purpose is. You know, as they're talking and these themes keep coming up, I'm like, hey, I think we're talking about your life purpose here, which is huge for people to realize and to own. And that's really fun and exciting when that happens. But I also want to tell people that if you don't know what your life purpose is, or if it's really hard to fit your life purpose into a couple of sentences, 
I think that's okay. I think there's a lot of pressure to try to figure out exactly what your one thing is on earth to do. And I think that there can be a lot of pressure to do that. So if that feels like something that doesn't work for you, I really encourage clients to think about like what's meaningful to them and what kind of contribution do they want to be known for? I like that. If people want to know like, like what's their meaning in life and all that kind of stuff. But if you really don't have a North star, you don't have a direction. There's no directionality. I'm excited to hear three and four. Keep going. (laughs) Great. So three is being part of a healthy work environment. Okay. So what that's all about is, especially if someone's been in an unhealthy or unsustainable work environment, they have a pretty clear idea coming into our conversations, what they want and what they don't want. And these are some of the things that I typically hear from people. They want to be in a supportive and respectful environment. They want to have autonomy over their projects, right? They don't want to be micromanaged. Mm -hmm. Autonomy over their schedule as well. That's a big one. And they want to be in a company that's growth oriented and supports their growth. And then also a company that has really good communication. Like communication is a big piece of what they do. I mean, we've all been in dysfunctional organizations and you always hear this one common theme, like nobody's telling me what's going on. And there's nothing like, I was actually in one of those organizations once I was more of in a leadership position. And I was like, I don't, you know, I was just got there and I kept hearing this. And then the more I like kind of got down on the grassroots of what was happening, I'm like, of course, nobody knows what's happening. And so what do people do? They just become apathetic and they don't work really hard and they just kind of punch in the clock and nothing's really moving forward because Mm -hmm. they don't feel like they are supported, like somebody cares enough to share information with them. In the military, they call this information operations where there's a flow of information through the organization. When it gets stuck, then you have real issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. People want to know what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. They want to know when have they done a good job? Yeah. When has their contribution really mattered? Mm. Right. That goes back to the why. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't it crazy that you can get to a level of leadership and just not do those things? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that just shows that like a lack of like reflection on like what you would want. You know what I'm saying? Like there's nothing worse than you go through a period of time and you think everything's going great. I've had this happen where I thought I'm, I'll go to my boss. Am I doing well? Yep. Everything's good. Yep. Everything's mm-hmm. good. And then all of a sudden there's like, no, this is really bad. Well, how long has that been going on? Like a year. I'm like, could we not have talked about it like at month two or three so I could have corrected the issue? And I just think, I don't know if there's a lot of leaders just kind of, it's the Peter principle, you know, they just kind of get promoted to a place of inadequacy. What you bring up is, is feedback and yeah. being able to provide really good constructive feedback mm-hmm. that the employee can understand, absorb, and then do something about it so that they can improve and they can be successful wherever it is that they are. Yeah. Absolutely. And the fourth component is really a culmination of the first three. And that's having the energy to be the person you want to be outside of work. Hmm. So these three pieces all impact this fourth piece. So that's how do you get to show up for the people that you love? Are you able to take care of yourself? Do you get to exercise, eat well, sleep, laugh? have fun, right? Do you get to pursue other interests as well beyond just work? And so I think that that it's a component, but it's also the ultimate gauge of how things are also going at work, how fulfilled you are at work. I had a friend that recently left his job and people were like, it's like a couple months later, like you look like five or 10 years younger. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's amazing what happens when I get to sleep and exercise (laughs) and like, just genuinely, like just generally take care of myself. And yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy for him. That's great. (laughs) That's the goal. That's the goal. Right. 
and the thing that you're pointing to from his story is that the the stress and the not being able to take care of yourself does add years, so to speak, onto our lives. So finding a situation that allows you to take care of yourself will benefit your life in so many ways. So which parts, what, what part do people most mostly get stuck with as far as like trying mm. to figure out what's next? Like where, where do people, where do you find people are like, Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I get this, but I, I'm sticking, I'm getting stuck right here. Mm. So I'd say one of the places that people get stuck is when in their, when they're in survival mode. Mm. So if someone's in an unhealthy work environment, like if it's a toxic workplace culture or they're experiencing burnout, it's really hard to access that big picture because you're in survival mode. It's really hard to think beyond your day to day just because of the stress. Because part of thinking, you know, part of thinking about what's next requires stepping back. It requires some space. It requires some creativity and some boldness as well to think about these things. So when I work with clients that are in survival mode, I help them manage their current situation as much as possible so that then we can access that big picture. Mm. So I'd say that's one piece or one place that people get stuck. I'd say the other place, which was definitely part of my situation, was the permission part. Mm. So it's possible that someone's been doing the same thing for their whole career and they never thought they'd do anything else. Right. And so they find themselves all of a sudden wanting to make, feeling the pull to make a big change. But maybe they got a master's degree, maybe they got a PhD, and they're having a really hard time letting go of that vision of themselves. So, again, it's that permission piece that it's okay that you're changing. It doesn't mean that you're failing because you're deciding to make a change. That's really strong. That is really powerful. I'm sure that that gives people a lot of hope when they are making that step. Because you start thinking like, what are my friends going to say? What are my family going to say? I paid off $50,000 worth of debt to get to here. And now I'm going to do this, you know, but if we just want to use like history as an example, some of the people that have had the biggest impacts in our world and our society, like transitioned to do something different. And so I can see how that would be a, a hindrance. So how, how do you help people deal with this uncertainty and develop that confidence to, to make that step forward? So I believe that clarity and confidence comes from taking action, mm. not just sitting around and thinking about taking action. So one of the ways that I help people gain confidence in their decision making is by having them throw all of their potential career ideas up against a wall. And then we explore all of them. Mm. So I'm a big proponent of informational interviews. I suggest everybody, you go out, you get connected and talk to people who are doing things that you think could be interesting. Learn about it. And if it piques your interest, move forward and learn more. Get connected with somebody else. Right? Keep gathering that information and learning to see if that's something that you want to do or finding ways to dip their toe into potential careers, right? Getting some sort of experience. That's one way you can also gain a lot of clarity if it's something you want to do. And so I think that the confidence to move forward comes from the feeling of I've explored a lot of options here and I've been able to cross a lot of things off my list. And so I'm confident about what I don't want to do, which means I'm feeling confident about this thing that I've, I'm choosing to step into. Gotcha. So that's one of the ways that I help people gain confidence to move forward. That makes sense. It's almost like a process of elimination. Like you're, you're helping mm-hmm. them slowly figure out like what action they can feel confident in taking. And then that kind of goes, oh, well, that's not for me. And that's not for me. And that makes a lot of sense. In one of our previous discussions, you talked about success and like how you have a different definition for success. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah. So 
As we grow up, we assume various titles, identities, and with those come certain expectations. And a lot of us don't stop along the way to question, do these expectations slash goals really work for me? Mm. Is this really who I want to be? So as a coach, I'm a total neutral third party. And my only goal for clients is their fulfillment. So I can provide the space for them to take a hard look at what they assume to be true or what is necessary for them to achieve in their lives in order to be quote unquote successful. So really the, these are questions that your listeners can also ask themselves and they're really simple questions, but they're powerful. One is what does success look like to you? What's meaningful to you, right? That kind of also goes back to the why your why. And I know this question is a bit morbid, but I think it helps put things in perspective, which is when you pass on, what do you want to be remembered for? Ultimately, those answers will help you understand what true success, like what a truly successful life looks like to you. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard it said before, like, what do you want your gravestone to say? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't don't think I have actually know somebody that like wrote their obituary recently, just as a way to to really have an understanding like what your legacy is going to be. And there's nothing wrong with thinking about that, you know, and even because it will give you more clarity, I guess, into what you want to do right here, right now. That's very interesting to me. I think that's something that I've spent a lot of time in the coaching world for about 16 years. And sadly enough, I've seen a lot of coaches that have sacrificed life for championships. Mm. and um, their families, they don't have a relationship with their kids. They get divorced. And like at the end of the day, they're going to be by themselves with a bunch of rings. Mm. And uh, I saw that and I was like, I don't want any part of that. And there's a lot of coaches that do it and do it really, really well. And there's tons of examples of that, but I saw enough of the other side to where, and then they become addicted to that. And so, uh, you know, this idea of like, what does success mean to me? What is meaningful and what I want to be remembered for? I think that's, that's very, that's a very deep thing that I would challenge everybody to do. Mm -hmm. So Kelly, after listening to this and listening to you, like if I want to reach out, cause I need some help, like how do I get a hold of you? Sure. So you can come to my website. That's Mm kellyclendenning.me. You can sign up to receive emails for career inspiration and guidance. And if you're specifically curious about one-on-one coaching and what that could look like, I offer a free Q&A session so we can get to know each other and I can find out if I can help you. Awesome. Well, this was really enriching for me, especially as somebody that has just transitioned their entire life. And as I've been going through, I've like been taking notes going, okay, check. Okay, check. Okay, I need to go back and think about that one. But um, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. And I think people are really going to, they're going to have some things to think about over the next several weeks. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. And congratulations on your transition. Thank you. I mean, that's huge. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. No question. This is like a really personal (laughs) uh, experience for me because I was kind of going through all this stuff in my head. So no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm on the right path. So Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for joining me today on another episode of the Blueprint Podcast. If you found this episode valuable, sign up for my high-performance newsletter at www.ericcorum.com. And if you want to stay current on everything high-performance, follow me on Instagram at Eric Corum, Twitter at Eric Corum, Facebook, and I'm also on LinkedIn.